Hello, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're in Mark chapter 6, picking up at verse 29. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Such is the end of Mark's account of the ministry of John the Baptist, this dear faithful man of God who was even described by Herod as being holy and just, and yet was unjustly executed because the king, beguiled by the dance of a girl, was inflamed by lust and too uh, held up in his pride to admit what the truth was and to repent of his sin and turn to God for forgiveness. Instead of listening to the preaching he sat under, Herod rejected it and repudiated the spokesman and forcibly showed that by having him executed, having his head cut off, even though Herod himself knew that it was wrong. But, you know, God could have let them at that time just abuse that corpse further and throw it into a common felon's grave. And yet the disciples of John came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So there was some honor done to the prophet in his burial. And if you read about people who die and their burials in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it was a great judgment of God if you died and they didn't get to bury you. Uh, that was the judgment that befell Jezebel, and that was a judgment that uh, befell many of the enemies of the Lord. For your body to just lie out and be eaten by dogs or wild animals or birds or whatever was considered a great reproach and an example of being accursed. And yet here God made sure there was a tomb for his faithful servant. Uh, later we remember his own son, the Lord Jesus, is going to have a tomb also, even a better tomb, it was a rich man's tomb, newly hewn, unused, in mint condition. And when the Lord Jesus turned it back over to Joseph of Arimathea three days later, I would submit it was still in mint condition because our Lord saw no corruption. He was raised victoriously and gloriously from the dead. And so what a wonderful Savior we have. Now we continue on in verse 30. This is Mark 6 and verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. And this harkens back to what the Lord did earlier in the chapter, back in verse 7, when the Lord called the twelve to himself and sent them out two by two, that they were going out, we might say today as missionaries, but in the context, they were going out as emissaries of Israel's king. He was sending them out as his heralds to proclaim that the king had come, that the kingdom of God was coming near to them. And as they came back now, they come back, this whole incident of John the Baptist has been an aside because their testimony and even the work the Lord had been doing was effective because news of this came to Herod, and Herod interprets it through the lens of his guilty conscience because he remembers the wickedness he had done in rejecting the preaching of John the Baptist and even in having that prophet beheaded, as we've seen. But now the apostles return. They gather to Jesus and they tell him all things. That's reminiscent of what the missionaries will do later in the book of Acts when they come back to the church that sent them out. I think about Acts 14 when Saul, uh, or Paul as we know him, and Barnabas came back to the church of Antioch and they reported the things that the Lord had done through them. And on their way to Jerusalem in Acts 15, again, they report how God was saving the Gentiles and all the things he was doing through them. And that was a great encouragement to the churches. So missionary reports can be very helpful and effective. But here they're coming back to the Lord, telling him the things they had done and what they had taught. And think of it, this is the incarnate Son of God, so he knows everything they've done and taught, and yet he still welcomes them back and wants to hear it from them. And what a wonderful thing it is for us, if we know the Lord Jesus and are serving him, to come to the Lord and tell him about the things we're doing, to tell him in prayer. Not that he needs a report from us to know what we're doing. Of course he knows. But he loves to hear us as his children pour out our hearts and say, Now, Lord, you know, 
I'm witnessing to this person I'm witnessing to that person or I'm giving out these tracks or I'm trying to serve this person in this way I'm trying to accomplish this work for you and you know what I'm doing please bless and prosper it and the Lord gives us a great example here in verse 31 when he says to them come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while now even in modern times we know we're told often that we can't just work 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 or we'll work ourselves into an early grave that physically we need rest and mentally we need rest and emotionally we need to be replenished and that of course is a truism and yet there's more to that than uh, more to that truth here exposed to us by what the Lord does that they're coming apart to him and as much as we need to take breaks sometime from our labor and even in the labor of the Lord and the point is that we need to spend time with the Lord in secret we need to come apart with the Lord now that may not mean physically leaving your home that may mean that you go to what our Lord referred to as the closet that's what he called in the Sermon on the Mount meaning the secret little chamber you have or room or wherever it may be it might be your favorite chair the place where you sit with God's Word and you read and you commune with the Lord and you prayerfully pour out your heart to him and you say like Samuel said of old speak Lord thy servant heareth tell me what you want me to know Lord I want to read your word and I want to grow thereby and how important this is we never outgrow this because the point of being saved is not primarily to serve the Lord as much as it's a wonderful thing to serve the Lord and a great privilege think of all the myriads and myriads of angels that God has to serve him they can be his messengers they can come as his foot soldiers they can do all kinds of wonderful things in some ways they're greater in power and glory and strength we're a little lower than the angels as human beings we're somewhat down on the created order and yet it's not angels that the Lord has taken by the hand Hebrews 2 tells us he takes on him the seed of Abraham he hasn't taken the form of an angel he didn't come in the form of an angel at the incarnation he became a man he took on him holy humanity why so that he could get a new race of servants well indeed it is our privilege to serve but what he wants is children of God he wants people that he can call his brethren he wants family he wants people like himself now inherently in ourselves we're not like him and before we come to know him we're not like him at all we're the exact opposite we're sinners and he's absolutely pure but this is the wonderful work of God that he wants to save us and make us like his son the Lord Jesus Christ and that the chief thing we do is to worship the Lord to be taken up with the Lord to have that relationship with him where we know the Lord where we speak of the Lord where we talk to the Lord where we tell him how wonderful we think he is and we praise him for all the great things he's done we thank him for what he's done for us and we enter into his heart when we pray for other people we supplicate and ask for our own needs and we intercede asking for the needs of others this is what salvation is all about and we all need to come apart and spend those times with the Lord the more the better of course and we better get a jump on this activity because we're going to be doing it for all eternity for all eternity we're going to be taken up with getting to know the Lord spending time with the Lord uh, learning more about the Lord not just in some kind of intellectual textbook way as great as it is to love the Lord with our mind and that is a part of it but we love the Lord with all our heart soul and strength every fiber and sinew of our being uh, we're going to be loving the Lord for eternity what a wonderful thing that is you know I've known some people who've been privileged to be married for 50 60 sometimes 70 years and that's extraordinary when people live long enough to do that and I was married a little later in life at the age of 32 so I don't know if I'm going to make any of those years even if the Lord lets the world go on this long but suffice it to say of the people I've known who've had those very long marriages you know you hear them talk about their spouse and some of them are now widows or widowers and they were married to their spouse for 50 years or 60 years and now their spouse has died and they know their spouse is with the Lord they know they're going to see them again but they talk about him in such a way that you know that if the Lord would let their spouse 
come and spend more time with them, they'd be well pleased. It's not that they want them back. They know their spouse is in the right place. They know to be with the Lord is far better, like Philippians 1 says. They know that's much better. They'd rather go to be with the Lord and their spouse, okay? But the point is, after all those decades of living with that person, they don't say, eh, I'm tired of them. You know, I know enough about them. You talk to them and they tear up sometimes thinking about the one they love so much, thinking about all the good times they had and thinking how wonderful it would be to have more time together and to enjoy that time together. Well, I want to tell you, as great as that can be between husband and wife, as great as that can be between single people that are best friends, as great as that can be between father and child and child and, and, and parent, daughter and mother or whatever, whatever the human relationship, that is analogous to, but not nearly equal to, what the Lord holds out for us. Because knowing him, as a modern Christian song says, knowing you Jesus, there is no greater thing. Knowing God, the Father, Son, and Spirit through his Son, that is the greatest thing we can have. That is the greatest activity of a human life. Worshiping him and spending time with him is the absolute greatest thing. And as we give to the Lord, again, he is no man's debtor, and we find he gives to us far more in return. If we go on in service, we need to be prepared by the Lord. We have to come apart and rest in his presence and let him recharge us, spiritually speaking, so that we can go on in his service. Now, there's also the very practical matter that verse 31 says, for there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So the Lord recognizes that we are also in the body. In other words, we have physical needs. The psalmist said, he remembereth our frame that we are dust. And so the Lord here is very compassionate you guys need to come apart from the hustle and bustle and the, the great work you've been doing, and you need to eat. You can't just go on indefinitely like this. You have to come apart, and you have to take care of the physical body, too, so that that doesn't get in the way of what we're trying to do spiritually. And one can see the great exertions of the prophet Elijah in his life. You remember he got to that point in 1 Kings chapter 19 when he was so worn down emotionally and physically after tremendous exertion of the entirety of his being. And he got so worn down that he fell into a depression and even was wishing that he could just die and finish his service right there. So there needs there need to be these times of coming apart with the Lord, of spending time with the Lord, of recharging our spiritual batteries, so to speak. So may we be wise as we go about our walk and our service that we make sure that the most thing, the, the biggest thing, I'm sorry, our biggest priority that we have in life is spending time with the Lord and that we fight for that time, that we make sure we have that time with him because I know as well as anybody that the responsibilities of life crowd in and legitimate things of life crowd in. We're not talking about sinful things in and of themselves, legitimate things we have to do. We have to work, we have to go to school, or we have to relate to our family and friends. That's part of being in this world. But we have to make sure the chief thing is the time we come apart and spend with our Lord Jesus Christ. So may God give you fresh and good times with him even today. And if you don't know him, May you come to know him because eternal life is not just about living forever. It's living forever an entirely different kind of life. The Lord Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And he said, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you're not really living. And if you leave this world that way, you won't live in the eternal life sense of the word live. You won't enjoy that quality of life. You will go on existing, but it will be existing in outer darkness and the terrible punishment of a life that rejected its very reason for being, knowing our creator God, who also redeemed us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May you come to him today. To know him is to love him. I can honestly say that. God bless you today. Thank you.